thank you very much. It was very, very passionate and emotional. Thank you very much for that presentation. One of, one of, you know, in the last three years at Yale, we've had no less than three or four major olive oil tastings with a large number of the uh, communities. Uh, we, we even had an uh, olive oil tasting virtual, actually. We sent packages to home through, and then 600 people participated. If we called Guinness, probably would have been world record of the olive oil tasting on a virtual way. Okay? Time after time, every consultant that came actually on these uh, olive oil tastings, they said to the audience, olive oil that you buy from the supermarket most probably is not good. That 60, 70 percent, or even some, some people, they said even higher percentage of the olive oil that they would buy in the retail grocery stores probably is rancid. It's been on the shelf for a long time. It has not been stored correctly, or it may not even be olive oil. Okay? So when it comes up to the consumer choice, if they are exposed constantly to olive oil that is not actually good olive oil, what's, what's the salvation? What's, what's the solution there? Are, are, are there any mechanism to hold these supermarkets accountable or these grocery stores accountable for the quality of the product that they, it's misrepresenting what the product is supposed to be? Thank you very much, Rafa, for this question, which is extremely interesting. And I wanted to say something about that much earlier. But there, to, in my opinion, the, the answer is the health claims in the labeling. You, we cannot go ahead with these without unhealth claims. I don't know if Walter Willett is, um, agree with me. But there's actually um, approved health claims on olive oil, um, polyphenols, based on European Commission. These happen in 2012. Why nobody used healthy claims in labeling? So in my opinion, what we have to pass over and, and to pass the information is that Olive oil is a healthy product if there is a certain amount of polyphenols. We were talking earlier about this, and why don't we try that? People is really into health, so why don't we try to move things forward and declaring in labeling the health claims? I believe this is one of the answer and one of the solution. So I, I, I think your, your question is a legitimate one, but I, I really want to make the, the, the point that we, we've made, I mean, producers have made a, a great deal of progress on, on this front. Fifteen years ago, there were a number of scandals and, and issues that were raised about quite a bit of extra virgin olive oil not being so extra virgin if you followed the criteria. But uh, I think that um, that has changed quite a bit, and we've had leading producers, you know, uh, bet on quality um, and so the the olive oil that you find in your supermarket today i would say I, i'm speaking for the what's available in the u.s um, is is much better quality than it might have been a while back so um, the olive oil uh, community has, has made some very substantial progress on betting on quality so i, I think that, that picture that you're painting somewhat i'd like to push back back on that because it might have been an issue uh, a couple of decades ago, but things things have improved quite a bit. There is still oil which which you know might not be of, of the greatest quality that can be st still sold as extra virgin, but the incidence of the the problem I think has, um, has 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 been greatly reduced. And again, it's because a number of large producers um, in, in in Europe and, and and in in the new world have, have really focused on on quality instead of, of volume. And, and realized that it was a serious issue and it, it had to be, uh, to be addressed uh, effectively. And also because people have, have become more demanding, uh, whether, whether it's people in restaurants or consumers, they're, they're really 
going for a higher quality product and, and that, that has had an impact as well. Professor Willett, then Dessas, then Brad. Yeah. Uh, actually, that's a really uh, good question, a good point, uh, because I hear too, uh, you can't trust something that says extra virgin olive oil at the grocery store. And my impression has been like years on Javier that uh, there's lots of good, uh, uh, most of the olive oil at the store I've tried that says extra virgin is, is, is okay and pretty good, and not all of it. And there's important differences. Uh, it would really be helpful probably to have someone do a follow-up survey uh, to actually, it would be a good story um, in, in the press to see what it is today. Now that couldn't be funded by the olive oil company or no one would believe it. So maybe Greg, so the CIA could do something like this. Uh, it, it, would, it would be actually, we could do it together. Uh, if, uh, it would, I think there does need to be some sort of correction about that. And, and uh, you, John Javier, you uh, presented your data about preferences there, which looked like butter was the winner. But I wonder if you could analyze the data a little bit differently, because you made the really important point that there's a segmented population. We're not all the same. And that we always need to keep reminding ourselves of that. And thank you for that point. And it would be interesting to see if for each type of butter, uh, is there uh, one olive oil that someone liked as well as or better than butter. Uh, you know, it's a different way of looking at it. And that raises the question, uh, when we ask for butter at a, at a restaurant food service, should we be given, that's an easy place to start labeling uh, uh, because we don't have to wait for official policy. Should we be labeling our olive oils as bitter or mild or fruity, something like that, so people can pick the one that they like best, uh, recognizing that there is diversity in olive oil and also diversity in people's preferences. That is very much the, the way to do it. And um, the, the, the leader on, on the market in California, California Olive Ranch, has done that very effectively, um, where on the label they will describe what kind of oil they are proposing to you. And, uh, and I think consumers uh, relate to that very well. So, um, you know, the, the, the problem is that the ripe fruit style is not as common anymore, at least in, in the new world, and people are banking more on a green fruity type of oil. Uh, but that's the profile that would be the closest to what you get with butter. Um, but, but yes, I, I, I think uh, uh, doing marketing, the sensory profile or uh, advertising it uh, would be a great step to take, just like it has been for wines and beers and, and other products. Thanks. Um, let me just thank Gemma for a very um, passionate presentation. And I think in one slide there you exemplified the word preservation of this whole olive oil culture with your, with your sons and your father. So thank you for that. Um, I want to bring back a point that Antonia made earlier about uh, we have the evidence, we have the science. If we don't do something about policy, I think we're stuck. And I think you raised the point of, um, of uh, the health claim. Not only we haven't done a lot on that, I think, but now we're faced with this Nutri-Score thing, which is another big topic. When, I don't think we have time to talk about it on this one. But I'm going to... Um, not to put them on the spot, but I will. Um, Jaime and, and, and Joe here. What do we need to do to change policy? We have the science, 50, 60, 70 years. What do we need to do from your perspective? Well, thanks. I, I, I was <laughs> pre previously involved in, 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 in making policy as I was working for the European Commission, making proposals of legislation. And I was also working in the Spanish government, defending interest in the EU for the, Spanish, for the food legislation. And now I'm in, on the other side of the, of the table. And we are facing this issue of Nutri-Score. No, it's a mis, uh, for those who are not aware, it's a great miscommunication about uh, nutrition or health. 
And, and, and in the case of olive oil, I, don't, I think it's a good, good attempt to provide information, generally speaking, but with a particular case of olive oil, it's very unfortunate. And we have the, the, the European Commission needs to, to put a, a piece of legislation on, on top of the, uh, on, on the, on the table for the discussion of different member states, which will end with the adoption of a piece of law, which will make the politics regarding this kind of uh, labeling, health labeling. And that's what we are trying to do. How, how can we influence them to, to proper um, portrait what we know by science that it's good for health? How can we explain that properly uh, to, the, to the consumers? And the first thing is that it's not that easy. That is the, 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 it's not as straightforward because there are many angles. It's a complex uh, process. But in the, in the policy making, there are, there are um, different steps. So we are starting, so typically they start with consultations before they put a, a kind of this legislation. And we are participating in those consultations as international body. And we are also bringing the scientific community to participate. And, and they are doing, they, they are participating, giving us scientific advice, and we are trying to be as independent. That is very important that we, it's not a voice made like a producer country or a company, it's made uh, by people doing research or, or analysis and, and be as, as objective as possible. This is one of the, of the things. And, and secondly, is to make the, the people to understand, you know, because sometimes they, they have to make this uh, legislation for the whole bunch of products, and they try to make a perfect formula, and this perfect formula doesn't exist. And and that's where we we, we need to go with pragmatical proposals where we were discussing before. Well, products were already a, a, um, a health claim is recognized. How can this be under undermining in a global picture um, scheme? And and you you need to insist from the low levels at the technical people drafting the first draft, you convince those guys, that's the, that's the best. And then when, we, when, we, when you will have the, the final presentation of the le legislation, then there is a political debate. But that is much more difficult because every country or every group of interests, they have their own products and the discussion is very, uh, it's a lot of noise in this discussion. So the earlier, and the more technical you can influence, the, 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 the better result you, you, can, you can have. This is what we are trying to do in, in, in this particular case. And actually, we have a, a, a seminar that you are all invited to, to follow on, on this issue with, with um, uh, health labeling and olive oil. And we are inviting the Commissioner of Health of the European Union, the European parliamentarians, the technical people who is doing and and some of, of, of the best, uh, and, and also some, some, some uh, scientific uh, people to open the debate with, with the things that we know by, by science. So we, we, we try like that. I don't know. That's, that's what we try. Um, thank you for the question, Tassos. And, uh, and thank you both um, uh, for the presentation. It was very interesting and moving. And yes, a few points. So on the, on the question of health claims, um, in the United States, we do have a qualified health claim for olive oil. Uh, the North American Olive Oil Association applied for this years ago. Um, it was granted. It's for oleic acid is the health claim. Um, so that claim, and first of all, I should mention, it's a qualified health claim. So if you want to make the claim that it helps in the prevention of uh, cardiovascular disease, there's about 50 words you have to find room on your label as to qualify it because it's in replacement of other fats and uh, it's a long qualification so that's part of uh, part of the problem but as soon as we've <clears throat> we got a health claim for oleic acid uh, other fats join the party and and so now when the American Heart Association will grant its logo to olive oil it also grants it for corn oil, it grants it for canola oil. So, so it's, a, it's a problem. So what we need to do is, is have health claims that we can own, and that's the polyphenols. 
Now, the problem with the polyphenols, as I see it, of course, is that we don't have a standard yet for measuring polyphenols. Um, and until there is, we won't push for that in the US. Um, what we are seeing in the US, however, and I was talking about this earlier, are a number of companies pushing high polyphenol content in a way that I, I believe is fraudulent, and it's misleading the consumer. It's a double-edged sword because by, by these companies that are trying to mislead the consumer to buy their product, they are in fact educating the consumer that polyphenols are good. Uh, so I like that. I don't like that they're misleading consumers to say that um, the olive oil you find in the supermarket has no health value, because we know that's wrong. We know that the majority of the literature about the health of olive oil derives from the oleic acid, which is in light olive oil, and it's in the delicious campestri olive oil. It's both. Um, but the distinction is the polyphenols. And that's the message we, we try, at least through marketing at this point, to educate the consumer that the more taste, the more potential health benefits. So it's a very simple message, not quite 100% accurate, I know, but, but at least it's, it's, it's getting us there. So that's the answer, Tassos. I think, I think what we could do as an industry, however, is to, I think there's probably, I, I know I'm, I'm confident there's sufficient evidence, scientific evidence now, to get rid of the qualification on all of them. It would be an expensive thing, but something we could do, right? And that uh, the qualified health claim uh, is not unique to oleic acid or olive oil. It's actually applied to other foods like soy, like tree nuts, and so on and so forth. The reason the FDA only gave qualified health claim uh, to those foods is that uh, the evidence from RCTs uh, is on reduction in cardiovascular risk factors like blood lipids, blood pressure, blood sugar, and so on and so forth, rather than heart endpoints. So if you want to get a definitive health claims for olive oil, for example, you need to run a huge trial like the Pretimax on olive oil versus another oil, and then to see whether olive oil per se would uh, significantly reduce cardiovascular incidence, not, not just cardiovascular risk factors. So at this point, uh, I think several food uh, uh, commodity groups have tried to get this kind of health claims, but eventually they all gave up because it's impossible to run this, large, this type of large trials on single food. Um, but this kind of health claims, I think, are still valuable because, um, I mean, the, the language is, uh, is a bit um, kind of um, ambiguous. So it says something like um, uh, uh, consuming oleic acid in edible oils, such as olive oil, sunflower oil, or corn oil, may reduce the risk of coronary heart disease. So some people may <laughs> read a lot into may. Other people may say, oh, it's good for heart disease. And then uh, it, it doesn't, doesn't really matter that much whether it's a heart attack or, or reduce your uh, um, heart risk factors. So for, for consumers, uh, and it's for some other commodity groups like um, walnuts, um, almonds, and soy, uh, they, they don't seem to mind too much about this kind of uh, qualified language. Go, Greg. <clears throat> um, first of all, fabulous presentation. That was just um, marvelous. Thank you, Gemma. Thank you, John Xavier. I, you know, when I think about um, the olive oil world, you know, it, it's useful, to, it's unique, but it's useful to also look in comparison to the wine world. And in the wine world, you have now a situation where you have quality at many different levels. And I think we, all, we should focus, our model should be uh, not simply quality at the top of the market, but quality that is accessible to uh, the largest uh, majority of people to have the greatest good. However, in the wine market, you know, the, 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 the people that are focused on super premium wines, on investing in the best technology, on delivering the very, very best, their work actually moves the whole market, right? So we need to look at the connection between the top of the market and the bottom of the market and the middle of the market. One of the things that I think that this is actually a challenge to uh, my good friend Jean-Xavier is beyond 
um, looking at sort of the current level of response, and it's a little bit depressing that the, the needle didn't move in 10 years. But still, I would challenge you to now look at the next level, which is not simply measuring what the attitudes are, but, but what evaluating what I just wrote down, what are the pathways of consumer acceptance of you know, well-balanced, good quality, robust, bitter olive oil? So two things. You know, you think about genetics and you think about how we are alike and dis different as human beings. At some point, people in the Midwest of the United States and in Greece, let's say, or Tuscany, are more alike than, than they are dissimilar. And yet, millions of people in the Mediterranean like bitter, robust, full-flavored olive oil, right? So somehow they became used to that because they... Uh, Okay, hold on. Because they, well, I mean, much of Greece is, is early harvest olive oil. Yeah. So, so, you know, part of the inspiration from, from Paolo was his ability to lead people through a tasting experience. So, at, for instance, at lunch, you all had the fresh mozzarella, and hopefully you poured a little bit of the Cosimo olive oil on the fresh mozzarella, and you said, hmm, the, that really improves the experience. And, you know, there's, just like in wine and food pairing, there's this magic that happens with a really special olive oil paired properly with food. So that's one question is how do we help people through an experience that leads them to, to that? You know, it's much like in the wine world, a lot of people initially, all they want to drink is Chardonnay. And then suddenly they realize that there is a, a whole world of, of flavor there, right? But one of the things that I think is very interesting that sort of goes against what I was just saying was what's happened to chocolate in the United States. Because when I was growing up in the Midwest, we didn't know anything about dark chocolate. It was just a sea of milk chocolate, right? And somehow America, not everybody, has moved quite far along in the spectrum towards a higher quality chocolate, more higher percent of cacao and so forth, with a lot of bitterness. And it's very easy to find dark chocolate in every supermarket all over the United States. How did that happen? And how is that really different than the challenge that's facing us with olive oil? So back to our sensory scientists. Uh, if you look at the, if, if you do the research which we've done on, on many products where the only thing you move is the bitterness, whether it's coffee, whether it's, uh, whether it's beer or olive oil, liking is going to go down. I mean, there is an innate dislike for bitterness. You might like a, a bit of beer in the context of a bolder flavor, but if the only thing you move is the bitterness needle, liking goes down. Um, it, it's very difficult to move away from that. And yes, the, the dark chocolate uh, business has boomed, but still, if you look at the consumption of confectionery, I mean, it's largely uh, milk chocolate based and, and, and also heavy in, in sugar and, and fat. So th there is some good news because you need to start somewhere, but we, we still have some work to do. On, on the policy front, um, I think we should really hear from, uh, from Dan Flynn, who was director of the UC Davis Olive Center because he did move that needle and, and had some success in having some uh, legislation drafted at the California level um, about standards of identity and so on. So maybe during the discussion, I think it would be great uh, to have an example of how things can be, legislation can be developed and passed uh, for, for, for the right purpose. Oh, thank you. Um, well, to, to talk about the, well, let's talk about legislation first. I think what happened in California was that they were able to pass legislation that the industry drove, and the idea behind that was to differentiate California product from other oils that are labeled extra virgin. And as we know, the standard of extra virgin can accommodate a range of quality, and they were seeking to lift their standards for just California oil imposed by the California industry. So um, that worked uh, in California, and it, it, it gets harder as you go up the levels. And so if you go from the state to the national, that gets more difficult. Um, but I had a question about the study where you compared the dishes with butter and olive oil, and um, with the objective of seeing to what extent would a consumer accept switching over to it the healthier fat? And it seemed like, to me, even though the butter 
may have had the edge overall, but the increment between the liking with the consumers um, for, for, you know, for many of the dishes, maybe the increment wasn't that much, and, and in some cases they liked olive oil better. Uh, so from that standpoint, is there, what, to, to what extent did the study show that, yes, in say the food service um, models that Greg talked about, you could make this transition from butter to olive oil and be successful with the consumer. Just that, just like uh, in, in the other flip uh, experiments uh, that we, we conducted, the hypothesis is that you replace something not so healthy with something healthy, which brings flavor boosting or matching uh, properties. And then you get similar flavor profiles and similar consumer acceptance. And if you do the math, that's what you get um, uh, wh when you did the, the flip from butter to, to olive oil. So, you know, proof of, of success, again, it's not going to work with everybody, but it's going to work with a majority of consumers. And it's also dish specific. Something might work better with pasta than with, with a dessert, or, uh, and it also depends on whether the, the flip is highly visible or whether it's stealth where you, know, you don't see that you've switched the butter with olive oil or the meat with mushrooms. It can be visible or, or not so visible. We have three minutes, so if with a quick answer and quick response, uh, please, Joseph. Um, Greg, uh, on the question you, you posed before, how do we you know, emulate the wine industry where you have the, the good, the better, the best, and bring people into the category. We did some consumer research, I think that's very interesting, that during the pandemic, um, we saw a huge increase in, in consumer um, uh, household penetration, a lot more users switching from other oils to olive oil. And a third of them, we, we, uh, we interviewed a, a, a thousand consumers, a third of them started buying light tasting olive oil, so the refined product with less enrichment. But what we found is that within, um, we asked them within, um, I think the question was within two, year, two years, uh, we found that 45% of those were now buying extra virgin olive oil. So, so it's the key thing is getting, getting the consumer into the category, be comfortable with the idea that olive oil doesn't necessarily taste like olives, which they might not like. Um, and, and just get comfortable with it, and then learn and experiment. And so I was, I was particularly intrigued, Gemma, with the restaurant. You showed the three cruets of, of olive oil. Now, is that something you bring to every table, or is that a purchased item from the restaurant? That is the experience. So we bring to every table. Um, with the COVID was a little bit tricky because, of course, you know, in general, the cruet is sharing you know, so uh, you see how important it is to eat with other people. So that is the lifestyle we were talking about. So it's the, the moment of sharing something. And with the COVID situation, it was a little bit tricky, but we, man we managed to go ahead. And, um, and that's what people really enjoyed, and that's what it liked. So this is just a series of business models. So going back to the from cost to profit. Think how many millions of ideas you get from this model, okay? So um, some, mm, this is the olive oil experience. So what we're, you know, trying to figure out every day is how to um, experience at the top the olive oil. And I'm sure there's hundreds more, but it's just a matter of thinking and, uh, and you know, getting out from your head some ideas. Because it's a tabula rasa, you know, so that, that, that's the thing. Everything needs to be built. And, and it's a great opportunity. And I, and I mentioned, I, it, it struck me because there is a restaurant in New York that I've been to where they have this on the menu. So, so you pay with a basket of bread and three cruets to share with your table to try the different oils. So I think it's a, it's a wonderful way to introduce um, education in, uh, 
I'd love to see more of that. Do you do this? No? Okay. Monsignor Rondon, then Teresa, and then we need to move, go forward, sorry. In reality, more or less, you reply already uh, about my question. But anyway, uh, first of all, I want to compliment your speech, also your speech, really, and very, very interesting. And, but the other question is, what is the reason that is so many, many restaurants to, to do this? Uh, because if we have a confrontation with the wine, or also with the bread, there are different, and we can choose if we go to a restaurant, this or this other. But uh, in the European countries, it's not normal. I don't see anyone, any reason. So what is the reason, historical reason? Because we have this custom that is completely in, uh, different with, with clearly with the wine, and uh, but it, because the work to obtain good oil is like the work that, that we have with the wine. So I don't understand what is the reason of this difference. I, yeah, I'm not sure I understand the difference. I think there there is there is value that we need to to express. When in the United States, it was only till recently, no one paid for water. Water was free. Now you start to have okay, you can have the the tap water, or you can pay for I don't know, San San Pellegrino or something special. So the consumer wants to try different things. And uh, it's a way to educate, I think, with olive oil in particular, because there's so many flavors. But I think the restaurateurs who are here maybe can speak better to, to, to this question. So. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the opportunity, because it's not easy to speak. <laughs> all of us is very interested in the discussion. And first of all, congrats to all the speakers until now. Uh, and in the last two sessions, in fourth and fifth session, there are a lot of things to be said. First of all is the compromise of the whole olive oil sector around the world to offer the best quality to the consumers. So every single year, we can affirm rosenly that this is the best quality olive oils in the lines of the supermarket. Uh, and the following year, the next year, will be the best, better than the, the present year. So all the uh, production sector is working on that. We can be sure, because the first thing to, um, to be sure for the consumer is that they have a very safety and quality product that can choose. After that, the consumer can arrive to olive oil because of different uh, mm, questions. It could be the flavor, it could be the health, it could be the environmental, it could be the culture, the tradition. And there is not any, any single answer to this question. Every single consumer would have a, a reason why to choose olive oil. And the difficulty is to try to uh, confirm which is the reason why a single consumer goes to the olive oil. And we can talk longer. I know we haven't got time. And tomorrow we will talk more about that question. <laughs> 